Masquerade of the Guilty has got to be one of the best Archon quests so far. With plot twists so big, it truly does mark a turning point for all upcoming Archon quests. With Act 5 signaling that we're nearing the end of Fontaine's arc, we're now officially more than halfway done with Genshin's story. This video will contain a summary and analysis of Act 5 of the Fontaine Archon quest released in version 4.2, as well as a brief explanation of Farina's story quest as it relates to the main plot. I'll do my best to leave theories at the end of each summary section so as to not confuse canon information with theory crafting. Without further ado, here's Act 5 of the Fontaine Archon Quest, Masquerade of the Guilty. I'm your leafy lore Shira Menzliff and I read the Genshin Impact lore so that you don't have to. Please keep in mind this is a leak-free zone so any and all information included in this video is either confirmed by Hoyoverse or speculative in nature. No leaks, only drip. The story picks up right where 4.1's Archon Quest left off. After the events in the Fortress of Meripede, Traveler and Paimon carry out the rest of their sentence. Here at the beginning of Act 5, their sentence is nearing its end as they prepare to sign their release papers. The pair feel a massive tremor and run straight to Riesli to inquire about it. Riesli suggests that the tremor must have come from the surface, as the seal Nuvelet placed over the Reservoir of Primordial Sea at the base of the fortress can't have possibly failed. The pair then rush to Palais Mermonia to ask Nuvelet. There, Traveler informs Nuvelet about the dream they'd had from Child's vision. They saw him in the Primordial Sea, floating with a narwhal-like entity. Nuvelet at this moment doesn't have answers regarding the strange entity, but he is able to tell Traveler that the tremor they'd experienced earlier at the fortress originated from an incident in Poisson. After the tremor, the water levels quickly rose and receded, leaving extensive damage in its wake. Due to the looming prophecy, Nuvelet stays behind to form disaster prevention plans in case the tremors happen again, while Traveler and Paimon quickly head to Poisson. There, the pair encounters nothing but heartbreak. Poisson is destroyed with the remaining survivors being aided by the members of the Spina di Rosula. They find Navia who tells them that after the tremor, primordial water rushed in, flooding and dissolving everyone on the lower levels. A frazzled Navia rushes to get rescue and evacuations in order and afterwards asks Traveler and Paimon to accompany her to her father's grave. There, Navia breaks down and mourns the loss of her dearest companions and friends, Melus and Silver, who were dissolved by primordial water in the midst of rescuing as many people as they could. By the way, kudos to Hoyaverse for this insane writing. It's been a while since an Archon quest made me cry, and this entire quest had me in such an emotional chokehold, I was in shambles, okay? Shambles. Navia has a list of victims which Paimon reads out loud. The pair reassure Navia that Malus and Silver died heroes. Suddenly, Arlequino makes an appearance, and to our surprise, it turns out that Navia and Arlequino are well acquainted. Arlequino had dispatched Fatui agents to assist in Poisson's relief efforts. The Fatui had also been funding the activities of the Spina di Rosula. Remember, the Spina di Rosula is a crowd-funded organization. It appears Arlequino has immense care for the people of Fontaine and seeks to protect them from the prophecy. But she also hopes that in the future, the Spina di Rosula would be able to aid the Fatui in their future endeavors. Arlequino informs the group that the House of the Hearth discovered ancient ruins near Poisson. Judging from the age of the ruins, they could contain information about the prophecy and the recent surge of the primordial sea. Navia tags along in order to help investigate and distract herself from her pain. The ruins are flooded with primordial water, which makes this situation particularly dangerous for Navia. She's Fontanian and fully capable of dissolving. As the group progresses forward, a bridge gives way, causing Navia to fall. Traveler runs to grab her, but it's too late. Navia falls into the primordial water. She wakes up in Poisson, but everything is off. Note how the edges of this scene are rippling like water. Melus and Silver escort her to the opera Epicles for her alleged trial. Her crime? Being too helpful, it seems. As an integral part of Poisson society, the court deems her too important to leave. This trial is meant to keep her there. Forever. Melus and Silver jump to protect Navia, and this is where Navia realizes that she is surrounded by all the victims of Poisson. They have all been turned into Oceanids and seek to make Navia part of their collective. Nuvelet comes to Navia's rescue and she finally wakes up in the real world. He explains that when she fell in, two Oceanids, Melus and Silver, had protected her from the primordial water just long enough for Nuvelet to pull her out. Not only were Malus and Silver heroes in the kitchen and heroes in Poisson, but also heroes after death. Nuvelet had finally made it to Poisson only to find Arlequino and the Fatui assisting in rescue and relief. 
Aralequino herself informed Nouvellet about the group's whereabouts. The group continues to explore the ruins where they encounter stone tablets that seem to contain the prophecy. The first tablet appears to be missing. The second tablet contains an image of the previous Hydro Archon Nigeria and her people kneeling before an island in the sky, supposedly begging for forgiveness while this island in the sky casts its judgment. The third tablet shows Farina and water surrounded by people. The fourth tablet shows Farina alone on her throne, the piece of the prophecy that's widely known in Fontaine. The group splits up from here. Navia attends to her people, Nivellet attempts to ask Farina about the prophecy, and Traveler and Paimon head back to their resting spot at the Fleuve saint They run into none other than Mona, who's in Fontaine for business regarding the steambird and the prophecy. Although Mona is a talented astrologer, the magnitude of the prophecy is something that's proven to be difficult for her to decode. Reading this prophecy is akin to reading the future of all of Devat and requires someone with more skill than her to read, someone like her master Barbaloth and others in the Witch Coven, the Hexen Circle. Traveler pleads for Mona to get them in touch with her master, which she agrees to attempt. The next day, Traveler and Paimon head over to Nouvellet's office only to find Farina and Nouvellet arguing. Although Farina expresses sadness over the disaster in Poisson, she still continues to dodge Nouvellet's questions about the prophecy and runs out of the room in a hurry. A disappointed Nouvellet states that the only way for them to pry the truth out of Farina is to hold her on trial. Traveler and Nouvellet recruit Navia, the Lini siblings, and Clorande to discuss the Grandmaster plan to trap Farina and get her to reveal her secrets. Back at the Fleuve Sondre, Traveler and Paimon are met with a talking teacup. This familiar voice is the same prophetic voice that they heard back in Sumeru, the Hexen Circle Witch, N. N has arrived in place of Barbaloth to inform Traveler a couple things about this prophecy. Although fate cannot easily be changed, fate is merely from the perspective of the gods, and the gods' gaze has blind spots. Traveler contemplates N's words and has a great introspective moment. If they knew the world was going to end, what would they do? The citizens of Fontaine are all optimistic in their answers, living life to the fullest until the very end. Traveler and Paimon rest in the Fleuve Slendra, but one day they are approached by Isadora, who informs them that a small-scale riot had broken out in the opera Epicles. Some people had accused Farina of not doing anything to prevent the prophecy crisis, causing Farina to run out of the opera house. Paimon deduces that Farina must be in Poisson, consumed by overwhelming grief, and thanks to her deduction skills, the pair indeed find Farina crying in Poisson. Several rioters arrive to chase Farina, and Traveler and Paimon beckon Farina to hide away in a house. A tremor occurs, much like the one that preceded the disaster in Poisson. Time is running out, and Traveler pleads with Farina to tell them the truth about the prophecy and impart any knowledge she has regarding the potential destruction of Fontaine. Her facade begins to crack, and she admits that she had been investigating the prophecy for hundreds of years, but to no avail. She scarily states that we cannot make an enemy of the divine. No matter what we do, the will of the heavenly principles will have its way, and the prophecy shall be fulfilled. Although it's Farina's duty to bear this heavy burden as the Hydro Archon, Traveler insists on being a witness to help relieve some of her worries. Another earthquake occurs, and this time, the house collapses. The group find themselves in the opera Epicles, the house being a more elaborate version of Linny's original swapping magic trick. The people who had chased her out of the opera house and into the house in Poisson were actually members of the Spina di Rosula in disguise. The trial begins with Traveler as the prosecutor and Farina as the defendant. Her charge? Traveler accuses her of pretending to be the Hydro Archon. With the help of Charlotte, who had compiled a document containing all the events in Fontaine since Traveler arrived, and the group, they're able to provide key pieces of evidence to prove that Farina isn't actually a god. She refuses a duel from Clorin, something that shocks the crowd since a god should have theoretically been able to win a duel against a human. She's affected by primordial water, something that a god supposedly should have had immunity to. And she's unable to display complete control over the hydro element, even close to the ability of a vision wielder. With this evidence, the court has made their decision. Farina is just a human pretending to be a god. The Oratrice procures the final verdict for her crimes and surprisingly, sentences Farina to death. Clemina shows up to the scene with the missing first tablet from the prophecy in the ruins. The first tablet depicts the previous Hydro Archon Egeria turning Oceanids into humans. 
Now Traveler and Nouvellet are able to piece together the secrets behind Fontaine's prophecy. Egeria's Oceanids had longed to live on land as humans. She had used the Primordial Sea to grant her Oceanids human bodies by pouring the water into their blood vessels. The catch was that if these Oceanid humans were to come into contact with Primordial Water again, they would turn back into Oceanids. Hence the people of Fontaine dissolving and turning into Oceanids. Egeria using the Primordial Sea to create humans was done without the approval of the Heavenly Principles. Thus, the sin of the Hydro Archon was creating the people of Fontaine. The second tablet depicts Egeria asking for forgiveness. The third slate, as we've witnessed, predicted the people of Fontaine putting Farina on trial. But that still leaves the fourth slate. What is the true reason the Primordial Sea has been rising, potentially dissolving everyone in Fontaine and leaving Farina alone crying on her throne? The answer is in the vision dream that Traveler had about Child, the all-devouring narwhal. Right on cue, the narwhal emerges from an abyssal rift that opens in the opera house. Child in his foul legacy form appears to stall the monster. According to Nouvellette, the narwhal is an abyssal entity that's been using the primordial sea to grow, hence the rising sea levels. Naturally, since Fontanians contain traces of primordial sea in their blood, the narwhal was drawn to where people were gathered in the opera house. Before the group can formulate a plan to stop the narwhal, the Oratrice prepares to carry out the death sentence on Farina. Amidst the blast, Nouvellet and Traveler get sent into different realms. Nouvellet finds himself face to face with the true Hydro Archon Fossilors. When Egeria turned her Oceanids into the people of Fontaine, she had also turned Fossilors into a human from an Oceanid. And when Egeria had died during the Cataclysm, the burden of the prophecy and the title of the Hydro Archon went to Fossilors. In order to save the people of Fontaine from the prophecy, Fossilors had plotted to deceive the Heavenly Principles. When she ascended as an Archon, she split her divinity and body and spirit, leaving Farina as her human body and her divine self as a spirit living inside of the Orochis. For 500 years, the Orochis had been collecting immense amounts of indemnidium, people's belief in justice. We find out that the Oratrice is in fact a device created to eventually kill the God of Justice, as well as destroy the divine throne of the Hydro Archon. This essentially means there will be no future Hydro Archon. In order for Fossilor's plan to work, Farina needed to pretend to be the Hydro Archon long enough for the Oratrice to collect enough power to kill a god and evade the Heavenly Principle's detection. And she did so dutifully for 500 years, suffering that Traveler witnesses in another realm after accessing Farina's memories through her tears. Nouvellet being the Chief Justice of Fontaine was no accident either. Throughout all the trials he's witnessed as the Chief Justice, Nouvellet developed true empathy and love for the human race, something that Fossilors was counting on him to develop for the sake of Fontaine. With the Hydro Archon sacrificing herself and his full dragon sovereign powers returned, Nouvellet now has the ability to save the people of Fontaine from dissolving. He does so by absolving Fontanians of their sin and turning them into true humans, unable to be dissolved upon contact with the Primordial Sea. With Nouvellet as a fully-fledged dragon sovereign, he and Traveler enter the Primordial Sea in order to subdue the all-devouring narwhal. They're aided by Skirk, child's master from the Abyss. We learn some very shocking truths from her which we'll cover in a bit. Due to the battle with the all-devouring narwhal, the waters above them in Fontaine must have been thrown into chaos. But thanks to Nouvellet declaring the Fontanians true humans and Riesley's boat which only got like 5 seconds of screen time, Fontaine is saved from the prophecy and the waters quickly recede. Although Fontaine is left with some post-flood cleanup, all is well that ends well or so it seems. Nouvellet grants Arlequino with the Hydronosis now having no need for it. Farina abdicates her role as the Hydro Archon and is now able to live life pursuing her own passions. And Charlotte now gets her long-awaited interview with Riesley. Nouvellet bids us farewell as Traveler and Paimon potentially make their way to Natland, the Nation of Dragons, and warns them that the Fatui Harbinger Capitano should be stirring trouble there. Nouvellet also reveals some pretty startling information, but we'll go over it in a sec. In a nutshell, these are the most important takeaways from Act 5 for now. Fossilors, the true Hydro Archon, sacrificed herself to save the people of Fontaine and defy the Heavenly Principles. Farina was the human counterpart to Fossilors and was pretending to be the Hydro Archon in order to trick the Heavenly Principles into thinking the prophecy would play out as they initially hoped. How is Farina able to live for 500 years if she's only human though? Farina was cursed, just as Arlequino had detected in the previous Archon quest. For as long as the Hydro Archon's divinity existed, Farina will cease to age. Now it's implied, Farina will now live a normal human lifespan from this moment forward. Now let's analyze this Archon quest and go over some of the more impertinent things such as the information we learned from Skirk and Nouvellet. 
First, I really want to applaud Genshin's music and its composers. Back in the ruins, that the ancient prophecy the music that plays is reminiscent of the Impressionist era. French composer Claude Debussy is often known as the father of Impressionism, which is classified by its smoky and dreamlike sound. As somewhat of a music nerd that's been playing piano for some years now, I instantly recognize the influence since it's one of my favorite time periods in music. Seriously, kudos again, Hoyoverse. We unlock some important lore about Mona. Up until now, it was a popular belief that Mona is Fontanian, but we learned that Mona was born in Mondstadt, where her parents migrated to Dorman Port. She traveled with her master Barbaloth for a while until she settled down in Mondstadt City. Speaking of witches, the Hexen Circle is a coven of witches that conduct airmen cell explorations and tea parties. Known members include Klee's mother Alice, Albedo's master Reindatir, Mona's master Barbaloth, and N, who we learn is Nicole in the Wind Blooms Breath event back in version 3.5. We also learn that there are tears when it comes to these witches. Mona's last name is Magistus, a title her master gave her which means great. In a show of petty humor, her master Barbaloth changed her own name to Trismagistus to mean thrice as great. According to Mona, there are different degrees of the power of divinity. Mona herself is a talented astrologist who's able to use hydromancy in the stars to determine people's fates, but above her are visionaries, a tier of prophets who are able to decipher world-changing prophecies, abilities beyond Mona's current expertise. Speaking of visionaries, we learn of another visionary besides just the members of the Hexen Circle. Although she's Child's master and mentor, Skirk reveals that she also has a master herself, a mysterious man known as Surtaloji. Most of us are probably familiar with Albedo's nefarious master, Gold or Reindatir. For a quick recap, she's often credited for having been an antagonistic entity during the Cataclysm, unleashing her abyssal creations into the world. It turns out, there are more people like her. Skirk's master the Foul, Surtaloji, Gold, Reindatir, and a mysterious visionary named Vedrfolnir. Could the visionary Vedr Fornir have been the one to provide Fontaine's famous prophecy? All three of them appear to be in pursuit of perfection. We see a glimpse of this in Gold's work towards her primordial human project, of which Albedo was a perfect result. It's interesting because Gold is referred to as a sinner, and the Hydra Archon Sin was creating humans illegally against the will of the heavenly principles. Is Sin somehow related to the creation of life? Playing God, essentially? If so, was the original sinner who spoke through the crystal in the Karabar Archon quest also responsible for creating life? Also, these names are all Norse, so could this imply that Skirk's master and the visionary Vedrfolnir are Conrian? These questions are all becoming speculative in nature, so now we can move on to the theory portion of this video. Skirk also reveals some pretty startling information to Nuvelet during their final interaction in the Primordial Sea. The Gnosis are made from the remains of the third descender. It's okay if you were like, huh, huh? during this part, because I can explain. The earliest mention of descenders dates back all the way last year during the Akasha Pulse's The Cop of Flame Rises, Archon Quest in version 3.2. At the end of the quest, Nahida informs us that descenders are entities that came from outside of Teyvat. The Fatui is currently aware of four descenders, and Nahida hypothesizes that the first descender was the Heavenly Principles. Traveler is the fourth descender. Apparently, the remains of the descender before Traveler arrived are what the Gnosis are made from. Gnosis allegedly contain the trapped powers of the original seven dragon sovereigns. Could the remains of the third descender be the vessels that hold these powers? And what's the significance behind them being shaped like chess pieces? If the Gnosis were made from the remains of the Third Descender, is Traveler somehow a Gnosis? I don't necessarily think that's the case, but Traveler does bear some similarities to a Gnosis. They are conduits of elemental energy, and their kit, specifically their Hydro Kit, somewhat implies that their power mimics that of the Dragon Sovereign's powers. Speaking of chess, Traveler is essentially a pawn in the grander story of Genshin, being told where they can and can't go. Since the Fatui's goal is to collect all the Gnosis, what is the Saritza hoping to achieve? Is she trying to restore power to the Dragon Sovereigns, or is she trying to somehow revive the Third Descender? The theme of Natland's Archon Quest is Incandescent Ode of Resurrection, according to the Travail trailer. Either she's trying to revive the Pyro Dragon Sovereign, uh, La Signora, or a revived Third Descender is just what she needs in her battle against Celestia. But just who could this third descender be? It's important to note that Traveler's Abyss sibling is not considered a descender. It seems their fate is being tampered with according to Nahida since we have concrete evidence from Traveler's own eyes that their sibling did in fact come from outside of Teyvat. 
But from what we know about Gnosis, they seem to be granted to gods who were victors of the Archon War. Meaning, this mysterious third descender had to have been someone who up until the Archon War was alive. One possible descender could be the Outlander from the records of Jui Yun. This Outlander was said to have fallen in love with the Sealy. Sudden disaster struck after their union and they were ultimately punished. They were separated from each other for eternity and their memories of each other wiped. Although this Outlander could be a descender, we still don't know if they're the second or third descender, and we also don't know what happened to them after this story. I'm personally wondering if the third descender has something to do with the book The Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies. It's one of my favorite books in the entire game since I have a feeling it might have something to do with Conria. But that aside, the title The Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies is a play on words on the German fairy tale Snow White and the Seven Dwarves by the Brothers Grimm. Seven. Seven Gnosis? In this story, we learn about a night mother who is said to be the source of all sins. The kingdom of the Moonlight Forest is the only safe haven from the rule of the night mother. Kingdom. Paimon notes that the Gnosis resemble chess pieces. And what do these chess pieces represent? A kingdom. I have a feeling this book is going to be incredibly important since it's one of the first books we encounter in the entire game during Lisa's story quest, and only one out of seven of its volumes is currently released in the game. Again, with the number seven. Judging from the descriptions of the unreleased volumes, the most important characters in this story will be the Pale Princess, the Light Prince, and the Six Pygmies, with the Six Pygmies implementing some nefarious plot. I don't know, but finding out someone's body is being used as vessels for supreme power sounds pretty nefarious to me. Okay, but if I'm assuming the story is about the Gnosis and the Archons because of its involvement with the number 7, then why are there 6 pygmies instead of 7? Well, it makes sense now that the Hydro Throne no longer exists. With Fosilor's sacrifice and her eradication of the Hydro Throne, there are only 6 Archons left. This could mean that the Pale Princess or the Light Prince are possible contenders for the mysterious Third Descender. Again, I was particularly interested in this book because it seems so conria coded Perhaps the constant lack of sunlight and the nourishment of the moonlight was the reason for their beauty. Reminds me of the way Conria is an underground nation. Not to mention, Light Prince always made me wonder if it had something to do with our Chalk Prince Albedo, who was created by an alchemist from Conria. Albedo himself might not be the Light Prince, but who he was modeled after, Rindatir's idea of a perfect primordial human, could have been this metaphorical light prince from this ancient tale. Now, would it make sense if the third descender has something to do with Conria or its ancestors? Pieto, a Conrian sage, did join the Fatui since his goals seemed to align with the Saritsas. So is the descender they're trying to revive have something to do with Conria's origin? All of this is highly speculative, of course, and without the rest of the six volumes in this series, it's going to be hard to tell if this fairy tale has anything to do with the third descender. Not to mention, this story, in my opinion, might have more to do with Conria than anything else. So for now, until we get the complete volumes, I'll put this particular theory on hold. Now back to Skirk. There's been a lot of hype surrounding Skirk and her abilities seeming to coincide with Honkai's quantum element. But look closely. Skirk seems to be able to manipulate space when she reforms a narwhal into a black hole. Before we get into this, I'll give you a quick recap on primordial lore. The first god of Teyvat was known as the Primordial One, a god who was said to have wings and a crown. With his subordinate gods, the Four Shining Shades, he defeated the Seven Dragon Sovereigns and reformed Teyvat to accommodate the arrival of humans. We know of one Shining Shade, the Goddess of Time, Istaroth. The reputation Wings of Fontaine might actually hint at a Shining Shade or Goddess of Life. In fact, the Shining Shade of Life created Egeria in the Primordial Sea, hence why Egeria had access to it in the first place. Time, life, crown, why do these sound so familiar? Flower of Life, Plume of Death, Sands of Aeons, Goblet of Yonatham, and the Circlet of Logos. The Artifacts According to a Q&A session with the Genshin development team, there needs to be a prayer ceremony in order to receive their blessings and protections, hence why the characters assume prayer poses in the artifact screen. In the Chinese version of the game, the Goblet of Yonatham is more accurately translated as the Goblet of Space. Could Skirk's powers be related to the powers of the Shining Shade of Space? Note that the supposed elements of the primordial gods imply the introduction of five more elements. Now, if we look at the colors of the rainbow name card, five elements appear to be missing. Skirk's element and possibly abyss representing space, the light element representing the circlet, life, death, and time possibly being the leyline powers we see Danes of demonstrating. 
Ley lines would have the closest association with time since ley lines essentially contain a record of all things that have happened in Teyvat. Although I love this Archon quest so much and I consider it one of the best we have, I do have a couple questions that I really don't have answers to. I need more information on Child. We don't really get an explanation about why he's so tied to the all-devouring narwhal besides he somehow woke it up in the abyss. In fact, we barely learn anything new about him before he gets literally yeeted back into the abyss by Skirk. Our sentence in the Fortress of Meripede was 45 days, meaning Child was in the Primordial Sea for at least 45 days fighting the all-devouring narwhal. No wonder the poor guy was in bad shape. I seriously hope we learn more about Child or what happened to him because I was a little disappointed we barely got to interact with him. This next portion is spoilers for Farina's story quest, but if she was pretending to be the Hydro Archon in order to fool the Heavenly Principles, essentially Celestia, then why does she have a vision? Either the gods' blind spots are massive, or this means that Celestia doesn't actually ordain who gets visions. Cause why do members of the Fatui have visions then? Why does Kaya have a vision? It's probably decided by another authority? Dragons, perhaps? Since they are the original lords of the elements, technically. If that's the case, are visions being tickets to Ascending Celestia a lie? This part right here is a little murky, since we do technically witness one person ascending to Celestia, Vanessa, in Genshin's webcomics. Aside from this bit of skepticism, I did in fact thoroughly enjoy this Archon quest. I personally do think it signifies a turning point in the main plot, which perfectly fits Fonten being the halfway point in Genshin's overall story. I'll be playing through the rest of Genshin's story on twitch.tv slash minslift, so please feel free to stop by and say hi. As the number one Danesliff main, I'm bound by fictional contract to see this game through to the end. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next video. I'm your Leafy Lord Shira Minsliff, and I read the Genshin Impact lore so that you don't have to.